So thank okay. you, thank you very much for for the invitation and very nice uh, introduction. So that I'm amazed after all these uh, all these talks now and now going to more detail about the One Health approach. So that um, I, I will talk about uh, about the One Health approach, how I have been involved in the different projects pro projects and and how I understand it in a way which I have been working. I can say that I make already my PhD. It was a multidisciplinary way. And the whole my career, I have been working together with other disciplines. And so that I have been also writing jointly with uh, people from the education or politics or other, because uh, we, we made it together. So that uh, that's why I think that this, uh, uh, this way to go forward in research and, and everything is, is the most important. And I think that it is also the ethical way to go to the big questions, to have all these disciplines together. So I, I talk a little bit about the contaminants and infectious diseases, because they have been so much studied in the Arctic regions. And they are the, some of the things which has been focused. And of course, some words about some of the project. And uh, I hope that. Uh, through all my presentation, there will be the red line of the collaboration between the different, different uh, aspects. According to Nuret, your very recent uh, report uh, tells that the, in the Arctic we are 7.1 million people living, and as you see, that two thirds uh, of the people are in, in Russia. And so that uh, there are also 75% of the Arctic uh, settlements. Uh, uh, they are more than 5,000 5, people, so, uh, so that uh, rather big ones and, and rather, rather small ones. And I think that one of the important issues is so that we should also make a research in, in, in the big cities and, and bigger settlements and, uh, and also the rural regions. That is one issue I have been following during the last 15 years. But why One, her one Health is so important? It is pay, uh, in all the, uh, in the globe, uh, the indigenous knowledge is based on this one health approach. So that the, the health of the animal, health of environment and health of humans, they are very tightly interconnected. So that uh, thinking about the resilience and adaptation or individual or community well-being, it's, it's part of the, the animal health and environmental health. And that's why I think that it also gives our, uh, for the different levels of the thinking about the researcher or educators or policymakers, stakeholders, local and indigenous people, it, it also gives the possibility to talk by using this One Health approach. In some cases, there can be the diseases from nature, but there can be also health from nature, so that it, it's also the discussion and, and the view which we are looking and the point uh, of the different countries or different situations. And I think that this holistic view is, uh, is, is also telling a lot what is happening in the Arctic, because it's so uh, multi or transdisciplinary and, and also it gives the possibility of the co-production of knowledge and and it also gives the very natural way to have the connection to the, to the rest of the world. One important issue is so that it's inclusive, so that uh, it's also the commun community-based participatory approach. And I think that uh, it includes a lot of ethical, ethical aspects. It gives also possible to build uh, uh, ethical guidelines and, and also having this communication being in a way that it's respective and inclusive. To all. And now um, I, I go to some of the very simple part of, of, of the One Health, so that the, this environment, wildlife, and human interaction, which has been looking a lot uh, in the uh, contaminants, because uh, all those, uh, all those uh, things which is happening in the south part of the world is coming to the north. Another issue which has been already talked a lot is uh, zoonotic diseases or infectious diseases in the north. But this is focused on, on these two lines, so that we need to remember that in the climate change aspects, and uh, there's also globalization and many other things which are not in, in this 
in this uh, figure. Um, about the surveillance and, and also the monitoring issues there have been in the Arctic, uh, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. It has been running now more than 30 years. And uh, it has been a very important issue for, for the, um, the global registration and, and band of the permanent uh, uh, or this persistent organic pollutants and also looking forward the metals and especially mercury. And now we know that all these old contaminants, they are going down. But now we have also in Greenland, in some of the lakes or drinking water, there are some of the micro or nanoplastics. And also those chemicals which are, which are included uh, in the lubricants or, or some kind of these this, uh, plastics. And that's also the thing that we have this connection to the, to the other part of the world. And uh, these contaminants, they can come to the north by, they are flyers or hoppers or swimmers. And as Birgitta uh, said that uh, this huge, uh, huge uh, reverse, when they are coming a huge amount of water, there is also coming contaminants and they are also coming parasites and, and many microbes, uh, which are from the southern part of the things. And the middle of this, uh, uh, there is a, uh, estimation or there's a shown that what are the places where the human data, human, human um, cohort data is collected. And you can see that uh, Russia is uh, almost missing the data. And I think that it will be also a couple of years or some, sometimes from now. Um, I think that it's also important that we have some organizations like uh, Arctic Council. There was one project, uh, one Arctic One Health. It was uh, started by US and Canada. And we have had a lot of uh, joint meetings and uh, tabletop exercises. We have wrote uh, scientific articles. And we have established that kind of networks where the Russians are also included. But now, of course, that, that is not anymore possible. And we will also uh, have the meetings, this One Health approach, also in a global meetings. Um, and I, I, I was so sorry that the uh, Russian introduced a very nice uh, project called Biosecurity. And it was focusing on the permafrost store, what kind of microbes and uh, contaminants are there included, but also migratory birds. What they are coming, when they are coming to the north, what kind of things they are carrying. But now, of course, that, is, that, is, uh, that project is uh, lost. And then uh, some words about the Nunataruk. Uh, Johan already introduced very nicely. Uh, but I want to show this uh, slide so that uh, we have this physical science activity, those natural scientists who are who are looking what is inside the permafrost, what is happening there. And then the social science activity group, where is a lot of uh, different uh, expertise uh, together, starting from technology and also the health is included there, and um, economy and many, many others. And then how to integrate the issues. Now we have been running this uh, um, Horizon project uh, five years. We have one year more. And I think that uh, one or two or three years it, it came that we know each other so well that we can communicate in the same language and other things. But I, I very much appreciate about this, this possibility. This is very old uh, figure. I made this uh, 2007 and uh, together with my good friend uh, Erkki Alasarela. And uh, we were talking that when we, of course, uh, medical doctor and toxicologist is looking in the, in the middle are the humans and, and individuals. Usually there's mother and child. And then it's uh, covered by the chemicals, viruses, animals, plants and weather. And I think that this is ra rather what I understand to the One Health approach in my, my work. But it is also impacted the health issues, the society, politics, industries and economy. And the climate change is, in some places, it's a very big issue for the human health. But in some other, in other places, it has not so huge. There are more, more uh, pressing um, things which are more important. And this only shows that what we have been working in my, uh, in my uh, t 
team in the Nunataruk looking at the human health, mental wellness, and drugs modeling, risk for, uh, what kind of risks they are for the human health, and also the pollutants uh, question. And um, I very much like this type of the, the whole circumpolar information. And this is uh, one of the, our, our first papers was about the infectious diseases in human population in the Arctic. And they were gathering a review about uh, almost 50 years from the different countries. And unfortunately, it was, we were taking only Russian language because it was also covering Russia. Those articles which were published in uh, e-library, what is like uh, Scopus or PubMed or what we have in, in, um, in English, English site. And it was only tw uh, 72 papers. And uh, there are two countries which are missing, so that there were no infectious diseases uh, during this period. Uh, it was Greenland and Iceland. And I think that it might be so that when they published in their own language, so that it was not in English. That is also the ethical issue. When we have this type of reviews or we can try to have the, as much as information, we have the, usually the English language. But the important issue is that in Russia there is a lot of, lot of um, articles concerning, especially the genetic uh, or vector bond diseases, and of course anthrax has been one of those. Then we did the same, the wildlife uh, infectious diseases, and, uh, and there is, there very two, two weeks ago we published a paper, and it was a um, bibliometric uh, analysis, and we had more, more than 350 papers, and uh, there is one third of the papers came from Russia. And that is also important, I think, because we don't have this kind of surveillance system. We don't have that kind of monitoring which we have in the, in the contaminants. And those, uh, those animals and diseases, they don't recognize the borders. So that we need to, to do something in, in this uh, field also in the future, now when we don't have any more information coming from, from Russia. And the mammals, the most interesting animals were reindeer, caribou, and moose, and then the others. And there were, of course, a different type of the... Um, we can see the politics and other things in the national way, like Birgitta just uh, informed uh, earlier. And we can also see that the infectious diseases in wildlife, they have been more interesting since uh, two, um, during these 30 years which we have been collecting the, the data. And the most interesting has been the parasites in, in all, the, all the countries. I tried to keep this as short as possible because I think that <laughs> we are a little bit late. Now I have been talking about, about uh, uh, humans and, and animals and, and also contaminants and infectious diseases, but I think that we, don't, we have not talked enough about the permafrost. And so that uh, about those seven million people, there's one million people who are living in the Arctic coastal communities, which was in our research topic, in the, which is in uh, research topic in Nunataruk. And this is uh, Justin Ramage's uh, article, uh, some, of the, some of the figures. And you can see here, there's a Continuous permafrost is the very dark, uh, dark uh, brown, and those yellow ones, they are inland settlements, and the blue ones are those which are coastal settlements. And then there are the scenarios and estimates, what is happening in the next uh, 40 years forward, so that uh, there is a huge amount of new settlements without any connection to the permafrost. And I think that the permafrost is one important issue which we should uh, focus more in, in our, our activities and actions. Not only looking at what's they're happening, but what are their impacts for the humans uh, where they are living. One important issue is the drinking water. We really need to have a clean drinking water. And this, this is one of the... One of the uh, uh, outcome from the 
a Nunatar project. Uh, the very up, uh, this is a permafrost. Very up there is an active layer, which is um, uh, frozen and melting and, and doing like that. And then there is an ice rich uh, permafrost, is the blue one, and then is a saline permafrost. And when we are losing the permafrost going down, there's coming saline. And can we have the drinking water from that or not? That is a question which the settlements need to handle now, when they have also the huge amount of economical issues at the same time. And that, I think that that is also the thing that we need to have this discussion and, and thinking about also the future aspects. And then anthrax was already mentioned by Birgitta, so that that's also important to have the um, models and other things, how they are going to be in the different regions, uh, what are the risk, uh, risk areas. And uh, in the right hand, there's uh, mercury in soil. And this has been found that already on 30 centimeters in the permafrost, when it's disappearing, in some of the places, mercury, more mercury is coming up. And uh, if we take three meters or so, that there's a huge amount of mercury. And that's have been already seen that it's, it's a little bit increasing nowadays. And then I think that um, what all these issues under the climate change and permafrost, or what kind of uh, they are for human health. And um, I think that the uh, Arctic people, they like to be in the nature. And it is also giving the uh, more health. But if we are thinking that uh, in our topic of the, of the research project, was the effect of permafrost thaw on, and we are, I think, that many ways thinking, of course, because we have been said that they need to be risks, they need to be that kind of size, already shown that uh, what is going on to the drinking water. But it is also giving the, another type. But when we have these three areas, which already uh, Johan showed, we notice that in all these uh, cases, the, the self-estimated health was good, quality of life was good, and satisfaction faction of the life was good. And it is also in Longebu, which is not the indigenous community. We have also the results from, from Russia, from Yakutia. We have interviews and, and questionnaire, which has been done before the COVID. And um, there might be some new type of the information. And it also shows that it is only one place, and then we go to another. And the, and the situation can be changed. But it is also so that people were happy that the children can go to swim. And they have also the possibility to have uh, vegetables and other things, because we are, people are adapting so, so quickly. And some of them, they told that uh, whenever there is a, some kind of winter, that is a good thing. Of course, that is a good, that it's not so cold. And uh, thinking about the high level of the suicides, in the Arctic. At least in, in these three cases, it can be said that the, the reasons they are in other social or other, other issues, not in the permafrost thaw and the climate change. Uh, just uh, Joan already or very nicely informed. So thank you very much. And uh, this is my, my research group in, in Oulu. And thank you for you listening. Thank you very much for this, uh, another view. to these uh, these questions. And thank you so much for for keeping to keeping the time. That was excellent. You're saving our next now. Thank you. So um, questions or comments. Hello, thank you for that talk, it was very interesting. Uh, I have a question that Begitta touched on as well, which was the cooperation with the Russians. Mm -hmm. I understand this is sensitive now because of war, but do you think it's a problem that you can no, no longer have you know, statistics, information and cooperation with them 
since they have so much of the permafrost, for example, or because you're lacking the statistics of infectious diseases there? Like, how much is that limiting your work? I think that it's limiting uh, totally, because, of course, it's, uh, it's very interesting because we have the, of course, we have legislations, we have uh, laws, we have ethics, and we have also the national, uh, how I could say, in Finland, it, it is very clearly said that we, we don't do the collaboration, and the university is saying the same. So um, that is a big dilemma, and uh, I have, um, I have um, that kind of opinion that uh, if we have already collected the data, and uh, then we need all to write it together, I think that that's, uh, that's fair, because if you have interviews, you have collected data, and it's, it's unethical not to, not to publish that. But it is a big issue, and it is also a big issue if you have discussed with your colleagues and, and thinking to have that kind of research project. Are you stolen these ideas when you do that alone? And I think that we don't talk about that, not, not at all. We, we looked at the, whose name is there, whose institute is there, what is possible to do and what is not. And if, you, if, if your rector or someone else find that, okay, are you doing correctly according, according to the guidelines and orders? That, that, that's a bad, bad feeling, but, but we have not discussed so much. Of course, the EU is saying that you don't do, and that's, that's absolutely you don't do. But uh, that, that, that is very, very difficult. But I don't, I don't uh, start any new. This uh, article about the wildlife infections, they say all come from, from Moscow with us. But we submitted that before the war. I don't know if now I wash my hands in this. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions? Comments? Maybe I can, since we have a little bit of time, so I can ask this question that uh, what do you think? So, so you, uh, the impression mostly that I'm getting from these talks is that uh, uh, this is not an ethics question necessarily, but it's about the question of of these different diseases. Like it sounds more like there's lots of uh, emergence of diseases that might have been more like in the south and now we are also seeing it more yeah. in the north. But do you also feel that there is a very big risk for, for kind of endogenous things which actually would only emerge now in totally new kinds of diseases or parasites or whatever that might now emerge in Nordic countries on in, in the Arctic area? when um, like something that would not have been seen anywhere before? I think that the Russia is the most in, in danger. Mm. It, it is my, my uh, I don't know if Birgitta is, uh, is, is the same, same uh, I, uh, but, but I, I, I think that uh, thinking about uh, our countries, Scandinavian countries or Nordic countries, I think that uh, it would be very good to do more collaboration together I think that it would be having this new methodology, combining the big data together, and um, and thinking thinking like that. And I think that the citizen science, uh, at least in Finland, the hunters they are very eager to to collect the samples. They can, they can do that, and and also so that uh, because they are all the time being in a forest or or, or sea or or doing the things. They they see a lot. And I think that, that that is one of the issues that we, we should more broaden way to to gather the information and data. And also so that uh, um, many indigenous peoples, they say that uh, they don't know any more nature. They don't know what is happening because uh, it's, it's so unsure and it's happening, that kind of issue which has never happened before. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why they feel that they have uh, lost uh, their... Um, uh, the knowledge, what is, what is, uh, it's not updated, updated to the day, or this time, where they are now, and that that is also the issue that uh, I hope that uh, the it will be discussed more, and and of course 
included in our, because our, it's also an ethical question, so that what we are researching. Yes. Are we researching what the southern, southern countries are suggesting to us? Uh, I was born in, in Lapland, so that I'm a little bit north from the Arctic Circle. <laughs> that's, that, that's why I, I'm always thinking that who owns the Arctic, mm -hmm. or, or somehow. And, and that is also the one, one of the questions that we have, the different livelihoods and, and many, many other issues which are coming to the north. And, and um, it can be seen that many of the bad things, they are coming, coming from the south. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So yeah, I can have maybe one one more short question. Just thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Just related to that, do you see any use of the Aarhus Convention on Environmental Justice? It was signed in Denmark. It's in force. It was considered by Kofi Annan as one of the most important pieces of environmental democracy. And I'm just wondering whether you see any use of it. NGOs in the rest of Europe are using it a lot? This is a very difficult question for, for me because uh, I, I, we, can, we can perhaps talk more <laughs> of, about that, but we are now doing the, uh, the research in, which has been done in, in Russia together with the political scientists. We are writing the paper on that, and that is also the things which we, as a health researchers, we cannot see. And I very much appreciate, for example, the work together with Johan, so that uh, during these years I have been seeing much, much more also the health issues working in the different disciplines. Thank you, Thank you. very much for all the speakers. And uh, now it's time for, for coffee break. Shall we make it shorter, 20 minutes? <laughs>